Good afternoon, everyone. I, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome back from the Thanksgiving break, and delighted to see so many folks here, given that it is the Monday after Thanksgiving, and I know there's some weather in the Northeast, et cetera. So uh, great that you all made it uh, for this terrific opportunity, I think, is the best way to put it, to hear from such a distinguished group of uh, American diplomats uh, who have just returned from Northeast Asia um, and um, and to share their perspectives on what they've heard and, and, and how they engage with officials and experts uh, in the various countries there. So it's really a terrific uh, time to take stock of where we are in our relations with China and Taiwan and Korea and Japan. And I couldn't think of a better group of folks to, to give us those insights. Today's program is uh, live streamed and it is on the record, uh, just to be aware when we go to Q&A. And um, due to the uh, delegation's uh, other meetings, we have to close sharply at 1.15. So we're going to try to give each of them about 10 minutes to um, uh, make their opening remarks and then we'll move to uh, uh, get comments from the floor and questions to the panelists. I'm not going to go through their each of their bios because they really are so distinguished it would take the whole session to talk about their experience at our various embassies and various positions in the State Department and elsewhere. Um, but just to say that they've had postings in the region, at state, and other parts of the U.S. government and, and they really know the region well. They've just come back from a trip in mid-November, I guess. So you're, you're just back fresh. And we'll start off with Ambassador Susan Elliott, um, who is the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. To open the the one change in the in the order is Ambassador Thornton will follow Ambassador Elliott and lead off with the discussion of US China. Ambassador Elliott, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. LeMay, and thank you to the East-West Center for hosting our discussion today. Um, what I'm going to do is not too much talk about the trip, but just tell you a little bit about what's the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, because I think it's a Washington, it's a New York-based organization, and I know from spending 28 years as a U.S. diplomat, I didn't know a lot about it until later in my career. But we're... Um, a small, nonpartisan, nonprofit focused on uh, foreign policy issues. We were actually formed in 1974 by Hans Morgenthau. So we've been around for a while. This year's our 45th anniversary. Um, and we focus on, unlike some other groups similar to ours, we focus mainly on um, track two, track 1.5 discussions. And we also have a mandate to try to educate the public. So in addition to having private discussions, we do programs like this, where we brief on our activities, or we pick a topic, and we then invite experts to come and discuss those. So um, we uh, have been around for a long time. And I would say probably our forum on Asia-Pacific security is our biggest program, and it's in connection with that forum that we took this trip to Northeast Asia. Um, it's a trip that's been taken for several years, and it's, um, it's a way for um, us to bring experts and others together to meet with counterparts in the region to um, get a feel for um, their thoughts on the kind of activity we've been doing and, you know, what's going on in the region. So just to tell you, on our Track 2 and Track 1.5 discussions, we have um, a cross-straits dialogue. So we do um, mainland China, Taiwan. We also have a U.S.-China strategic um, dialogue, um, which we host every year. We have another one on North, uh, which really focuses on Northeast Asia, but recently on North Korea. And that's a actually five party talks now with China, Korea, um, Japan, and uh, we added Russia to talk about uh, North Korea. And then we have, and we did on this trip, we had a trilateral dialogue with uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Um, we did a discussion um, we invited some Korean scholars to come to Tokyo, which they did to discuss the, re the re current problems in the relationship between those two uh, countries. And um, so anyway, that's our main bread and butter. And we also have um, had discussions um, 
because we have a license from Treasury to talk to the North Koreans so we can track to um, discussions with them. Although since Hanoi, the North Koreans haven't really uh, been willing to talk to um, you know, to at least not to us and to others. So, and then what we do from our trip, we'll brief you today, but we're also going to brief people in the U.S. government, and we will write a non-attributable report about it because in the end what we'd like to do is try to influence um, U.S. foreign policy toward not only these countries in the region, but um, to other countries. We have another dialogue where we do uh, Russia, Japan, U.S., and then we have had um, discussions on the Middle East and uh, on Northern Ireland. So we hit the whole gamut of um, looking for areas where there may be conflict or problems and trying to have constructive track two and track 1.5 discussions. So I think I'll leave it at that. If you want to go to our website, I can also give people my card afterward. Um, you can have an idea of exactly what we do and the things we're involved in. And if you'd like to get involved, you don't just have to be in the New York City area because we do have um, programs like this in, in other areas. So I think I'll leave it at that. And thank, you. thank you very much, Ambassador. Let me ask Ambassador uh, Susan Thornton then to lead us off with some of this. And thanks for calling me ambassador. You know, I never was one. <laughs> it's great to great to be here, and, and I really thank all of you for coming out. Um, I had a snowy departure from May this morning on my early morning flight, so I'm very sympathetic to the trials and tribulations of getting out on the Monday after Thanksgiving. It's good to see a bunch of my friends here. Um, I am so grateful to the National Committee for inviting me on this trip uh, for the second year in a row. And I think it is just so valuable to a year separated, go back and talk to the same people uh, in Asia that we had talked to in the previous year and uh, take stock of where we've come in that period of time. And this trip was a very long trip, a very intensive trip. We had tremendous access and great meetings in all the places we went, which is a tribute to the folks who set up this uh, adventure for us and also to the reputation I think of the National Committee and of course my great colleagues on the trip. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the China stop um, and then we're going to go and into a number of the other stops but I think we went to Beijing first this trip. Uh, last time we went first to Taipei and it does matter sort of I think um, which one you go to first. See how I just kept going right through that little <laughs> crisis. Like good diplomatic training. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we did go to Beijing first. Last time we had gone to Taipei first, and it had been right after the 9-1 um, elections in Taipei, so it was very interesting to go there first and then go to Beijing. But this year we went to, to China first. Um, you know, last year I would say that the Chinese were still in the mode of trying to figure out the Trump administration, kind of could they work with the Trump administration, was there an avenue or a path um, to try to stabilize the relationship and get some uh, constructive uh, activity going on some various uh, areas, for example, the trade negotiations, of course, were, were actually very much a feature of last year's trip discussions in Beijing as well. Um, and I think um, this year was uh, slightly different. And what was interesting was last year we heard a lot of the same comments from both scholars and officials. Um, you know, concern, worry, lots of questions about how, um, you know, things might go. How bad could they get? You know, what could we do to stabilize things? This year, uh, the comments by the officials, interestingly, were projecting kind of calm. And a number of people said this, that you know, no matter how bad things get, U.S.-China relations are too important and things will come right in the end. It's kind of the synopsis of the official uh, projection to our delegation. The scholars, on the other hand, I felt, um, whereas last year they had been a bit more upbeat and a bit more optimistic that you know things could um, 
be righted in a relatively short period of time. They were quite, uh, I would say, despondent and resigned uh, this time. And I thought that quote that captured it best, and I won't quote individuals because all of our meetings are um, off the record in Chatham House, but um, you know, one person who's a regular uh, contact of ours that we meet with quite often said, well, things have gotten so ideological and so emotional that we can't even sit down and talk together about things. Um, and that was a pretty big feature, I think, of a lot of the comments. Was, you know, we don't really have any communication channels right now with the US. We're just kind of drifting and not talking and things are probably going to get worse. And I think most of the uh, scholars that we spoke with, their uh, expectation is that things will get worse, certainly before they get better. Um, I think that one outstanding question that they had was, you know, how long will this last? And one of the questions that was on everyone's mind is how long will the US remain in a period of kind of isolationism? Um, which, I mean, of course, nobody knows the answer to that, but it's an interesting uh, question that came up actually in a number of points along the way, not just uh, with the, the China stuff. Um, I think um, a couple of other points that were noteworthy and, and useful to raise here were um, there was a kind of lamenting about the constant resort in the mainstream media and by lots of prominent uh, figures, constant resorting to slogans to describe the relationship or these catchphrases uh, seem to be a lot of hand wringing over the way in which these slogans, you know, strategic competition, new Cold War, uh, trade war, decoupling, all of these labels have been stuck now onto the relationship and are, are unable to be dislodged and are, have a sort of driving logic of their own. So a number of the people in China mentioned that as a negative. Uh, there was some discussion about so-called weaponized interdependence, in other words, countries that are sort of um, including, including the Chinese that said the US and including we the US say China are both weaponizing interdependence and using economic sanctions and various other measures and these kind of tit-for-tat escalating um, uh, spats that um, used to be probably more appropriately and or at least more generally the, the uh, ambit of diplomacy rather than sort of straight to sanctions and other kinds of threats. Um, so that was another thing that was mentioned frequently. Our delegation mentioned, raised the issue of human rights in Xinjiang in every meeting. If the Chinese didn't raise it first, and in some cases they did, um, and we let the Chinese interlocutors know that this was a much bigger problem than they have assessed, and why that was the case, etc., and listened to sort of their defenses, um, I think it's pretty clear that they still don't really quite get um, problem and they think that they are dealing with a problem of terrorism in a way that is more in keeping with their way of doing things than the way the U.S. has done it. So we could get more into that in the question and answer session, but that was the consistent kind of response that we got and explanation on their part, which we didn't accept, but that um, nevertheless was um, a continuing theme throughout the stops. And we also went to Shanghai after Beijing, where we saw a number of additional uh, scholars, and these were sort of consistent across the two stops. Um, Hong Kong didn't come up an awful lot during our meetings, because we were mostly focused on sort of US-China relations and the strategic uh, problems and differences there. Uh, the demonstrations were, of course, going on while we were there. Uh, and um, the Chinese seemed pretty confident in most of the meetings that they would be able to handle it and that it was going to be handled by the Hong Kong authorities and that, um, you know, that it was nothing that they were, wasn't one of the top things on their list of, of, of issues to discuss with us. And then um, one thing that was top on their list of issues to discuss with us, of course, is Taiwan. 
but I'm going to let my colleague Ray Burkhart uh, take that topic. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I had already, uh, while you were talking, had decided I would just say do right into uh, what the Chinese said to us about Hong Kong, um, and then I'll and then I'll talk a bit about the Taiwan election situation and sort of what people in Taiwan are saying about cross strait relations. Uh, in in China, we we were told by some of the uh, some of the scholars, not directly officials, but scholars. <coughs> That Taiwan is not a uh, not now a top issue, obviously, in cross strait in, in U.S. Uh, Chinese relations, but there was some concern uh, expressed, at least by one or two people, that once the trade issue is resolved, I'm assuming it is eventually, that uh, Taiwan could pop up again as a as a as a major irritation, especially assuming that Tsai um, Ing-wen is uh, is reelected. As um, one um, China and one scholar in Shanghai, where we tended to interestingly get even more pessimistic views of things than in Beijing, which is unusual. As somebody who's worked in both Shanghai and Beijing, that's kind of unusual. Um, in Shanghai, one person made the combination that, that com the comment that Trump and Tsai Ing Wen both being reelected, there's the worst of all possible worlds. Um, <laughs> so that will lead to a downward spiral. Um, Going back in in in, in uh, the kind of cr criticism that was made about um, about the U.S. Uh, China uh, Taiwan policy that we heard was um, comments to the effect that the one China policy is now empty that the U.S. clearly seems to be distancing itself from its one China policy that the U.S. is now having more frequent and higher level and more open meetings with uh, Taiwan officials. Um, one example cited was Assistant Secretary Stilwell's uh, meeting with a vice foreign minister from Taiwan, which is the kind of meeting that even if we had it in the past, we would not have uh, sort of openly acknowledged it. Um, there were complaints about military, U.S. military actions, um, specifically mentioning that U.S. Navy transits of the Taiwan Strait are now essentially every month. Um, there was mention of a U.S. official vessel visiting Kaohsiung. Um, I had to do some research on that one. Um, apparently, it was a, a research vessel that actually is, was loaned to the University of Washington um, doing research uh, with all kinds of organizations, both in Taiwan and others. So all these things were considered unprecedented actions and um, therefore dangerous. Uh, there were also a number of statements we got from people that the U.S. seems to have sided with uh, Tsai Ing-wen and with her uh, uh, DPP party. And we offered great support to Tsai was one of the statements that was made. Um, we, I think most of us responded to that, that um, over the years, the U.S. has always worked closely with who's ever in power. We've always been blamed, you know, been blamed for supporting during election time the government that's still in power in Taiwan because we don't stop operating with it, you know, just because there's an election going on. But anyway, uh, that was the perception there. Um, I don't think there isn't. Um, I'm not sure I'll use my ten minutes. There wasn't cross strait relations have not really changed that much in the last year. And there isn't that much uh, I could tell you that would surprise anybody. Um, at an official level, they're still in deep freeze. There is no uh, official level dialogue going on between Taiwan and, uh, and, um, and Beijing. Even, even what they call white glove uh, dialogue between organizations like the Straits Exchange Foundation and the Association for Relations Across the Straits, which are ostensibly non-official, but everybody knows they are. Uh, even those have stopped. Um, what, what is true, what is important to the footnote to that, though, is that uh, sort of everyday dialogue dealing with the trade that goes on, the flights, the, the hundreds of flights every day, the shipments that are made, the mail, uh, all of that goes on. They find ways to keep it going. Um, they, that can involve 
make them sending sending messages from one side to the other that don't get resp officially re replied to, but nevertheless get acted on. Um, people, business organizations of, of, of Taiwanese on the mainland acting as essentially agents for the Straits Exchange Foundation in Taipei to carry out um, um, everyday kind of tasks, including taking care of maybe Taiwanese business people who run into trouble. So those things do go on. And there even are provincial level Chinese officials who continue to visit Taiwan and vice versa. Um, all of that can go on as long as it's not openly talked about and not, uh, and, I mean, and people will give you examples of cases where something like that got into the press and then it caused problems or, or it, um, or a visit had been arranged and because someone talked about it ahead of time, it had to be canceled. But it's, you know, quietly these, these kinds of everyday relations continue. Um, the, um, we, uh, we got in Beijing a kind of official view of, uh, from people who are identified, let's say they spoke authoritatively of how they see relations uh, are going. Um, they tried to give us a kind of, um, they tried to convey a message of patience. Uh, I think that's because the message coming out of Taiwan in analyzing the mainland is that the mainland is becoming impatient. And that um, if you look at Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping's uh, speech, uh, speeches, starting with the one he gave in January this year, it shows a certain um, greater willingness to talk openly about unification, um, talking about one country, <coughs> two systems applying to Taiwan. Uh, uh, there has been a, 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 a there's sort of a sense in, in Taiwan that Beijing even if it hasn't named a deadline, that it must have one uh, for unification. And uh, we, but, but knowing probably that we were going to hear that in Taiwan, knowing that we might suspect it be true themselves, the message we got from the Taiwan Affairs Office is um, the door isn't totally closed, but it might close. Um, we don't have any expectations for Tsai, from Tsai Ing-wen or from the DPP. Unfortunately, we do see both Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP becoming more and more secessionist, but we don't care who wins in January. The important thing is policy, not who wins. Um, we were told about uh, Tsai Ing-wen's four uh, miscalculations. Obviously, some sort of carefully prepared message we were getting. Um, that she thinks the US has her back and so she can provoke the mainland. She thinks that the worse the Hong Kong situation gets and the more she comments about it, the better that'll be for her election. She thinks that whatever she does, the mainland will have no choice but to tolerate. And she thinks that the worse US PRC relations get, the more that will benefit Taiwan. Um, I think my response to that at the time was I don't think she has those mis miscalculations, except for the one that's not a miscalculation which is that the Hong Kong situation really is benefiting her, her uh, re-election. And, and many people, in the, if the, the people in the, in the government there would not acknowledge that, but many scholars will acknowledge that, that the Hong Kong situation obviously is benefiting uh, Tsai Ing-wen in terms of her re-election. Um, um, one of the more interesting official comments we got was if Tsai Ing-wen is re-elected, it'll be impossible for, a time for her to separate from the mainland. If Han Guoyu is, re is elected, it will be impossible to quickly achieve unification. The fundamental political divisions can't be addressed in the short term, but we have confidence and we have patience. And then there was a lot of attention given to sort of 26 new actions that Beijing is doing in terms of people-to-people -people relations with Taiwan. Um, let me just say a little bit about the election situation. Uh, we heard even from people who, uh, um, let's say, are more in the KMT camp, more in the, in the, in the, in the opposition camp, that um, uh, Han Guoyu's attempt to get elected was not going very well. Um, seemed to be not, he did a, was a great candidate for mayor, but just didn't seem to be a 
candidate that was um, making a lot of headway is in running for president. And it wasn't just the Hong Kong situation. Um, so uh, in the legislature there, there seems to be the, uh, still possible that the um, DPP would uh, will, uh, lose control of the legislature and that um, maybe sort of a, what the British would call a hung parliament, you know, without anybody in clear control. Or you may even have, a, have the, have the uh, KMT in control. And I think we heard some comments that the, the mainland is taking some, some hope from that, that even if Tsai gets reelected, that if uh, the DPP loses control of the legislature, it'll be hard for her to do things so that would uh, cause trouble. Um, what else to tell you? Uh, the, um, we, we, the, there is some, in Taiwan, um, we heard a number of comments about how the economic, the Taiwanese are always bemoaning their economic situation. It's, it's never good enough, but um, and so there's you, you're always going to hear that. We heard we, we heard about it as usual, but then there were some people who did say, well, however, um, all the economic analysts have just said that the have just raised their expectation that the 2018 growth figure will be about 2.9 percent instead of the earlier predictions of about 2.2 percent. So the time say that, and and as we heard from people in the government. Um, we're actually doing better than the other than the other four dragons right now in terms of our economy, and that's true. Um, one of the interesting things we heard was that uh, what the U.S.-China trade war had caused some problems there. We heard about that last year. Supply chains were disrupted. That seems to be old history now. The story now is lots of um, of investment flowing from the mainland into Taiwan. About uh, 23 billion um, uh, investment coming back into uh, Taiwan in the last in the first three quarters of this year, maybe 50 billion into Vietnam. I actually made a trip to Vietnam just before this other trip, and uh, I heard the same figure in Vietnam. Um, lots of reasons for that, uh, not just the U.S.-China trade war, also you know, cost of labor in, 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 the, in the mainland, but um, uh, difficulty of doing business in general in the mainland, but. Uh, I think all of that will probably also help citing one in terms of her re-election chances. So I will stop there. Thank you, Ray. Jim? Thank you, and thanks to the East-West Center for hosting this, and thank you for, to the National Committee for organizing this insightful trip. I'll just talk briefly about our stop uh, in Tokyo. Uh, we had some very good meetings speaking with uh, authoritative officials. We, I won't give their names because we had promised uh, anonymity. But we met with people from the National Security Council, the Foreign Ministry, the Defense Ministry, uh, from JBIC, the Japanese uh, counterpart to Exim Bank, uh, from the U.S. Embassy, and also one very senior, recently retired official. And the reason that was so important was he could be a little more honest about his thoughts rather than speaking for the government. So it was useful for fleshing out what we heard from the government officials. Um, I would say there's good news and bad news concerning Japan-U.S. relations that I would take away from these meetings. The good news is the Japanese really appreciate our national uh, security strategy and our national defense strategy, which is, marks a shift away from a focus on transnational threats toward a focus on the emergence of near-peer competitors, China and Russia. They're focused on China. And you hear a lot, it's about time the U.S. finally sort of got it, that this is a challenge. Um, and then the second bit of good news um, is the virtually everyone we met with, including at the U.S. Embassy, talked about the close personal relationship between our president and Japan's prime minister. And everyone saw this as a plus, that Japan's views would be taken into account at the final step when the president's making decisions because Prime Minister Abe has the ability whenever he wants to pick up the phone and call the president. And it really is pretty remarkable if you look at how many meetings they've had and how many phone calls they've had. Um, it's, it's been uh, pretty impressive. And the last bit of good news, I would say, is that the Japanese want to see an engaged United States taking a leadership role in Asia. They want that. That's their desired end state. Uh, just to give you one example, when we were over at JBIC, uh, they talked about the BUILD Act and how important it was for JBIC to work with OPEC and EXIM to provide alternatives for uh, needed infrastructure investment in Asia. So no one in Japan is talking about wanting to see the U.S. be disengaged, so I would say that's a plus. 
Um, the bad news, however, is that um, they see the United States policy as uh, unpredictable and uncertain, and inherently in a relationship where you have an alliance with one great power and one medium-sized power, the medium-sized power is always going to feel anxiety because they don't have the same options that the great power does. They can't just walk away and find a better deal somewhere else, but they're a little bit more concerned than usual about the United States because of this uh, uh, uncertainty. And so the question they're asking themselves is, um, is this uncertainty and uh, lack of uh, engagement in Asia uh, a short-term phenomenon or the beginning of a long-term trend? And I think there the jury is still out, but they certainly hope it's not a long-term trend because they want to see the U.S. be engaged in Asia. So, um, and then the last point I'll make is uh, we did have a good trilateral discussion, U.S., Japan, Korea, track two, and the refreshing thing about that trilateral to me was everyone in the room agreed that a strong Japan-Korea relationship and a strong trilateral relationship was in everyone's interest. We didn't have to waste any effort convincing people that was the right state. So the, the focus was more on how do we get to where we want to go because we're clearly not there. Everyone acknowledged we have some severe problems. So that, I thought, was of all the trilaterals I participated in, the most um, refreshing in that sense, that we re really had some good, uh, good discussions. Um, getting back to Japanese views about Korea, I had heard this here in Washington, but I was surprised at the degree to which, uh, and by the way, this trip was before Korea's decision on Jisomia, so it's a little bit dated, but I would say the Japanese were at the point of just giving up. Uh, we've tried our best, we're not getting anywhere, we're not going to keep trying. And so my takeaway from that is the United States government needs to be engaged, but that's not in Japan's interest, it's not in our interest. But clearly without U.S. engagement sort of prodding and pushing the Japanese, not in public but behind the scenes, to continue to work with uh, Republic of Korea to work out some accommodations um, is really important. So I, that's one takeaway I took is the United States government needs to stay engaged. I do think the recent Korean decision on Jisomia and the Japanese decision and, and Korean decision together to begin talks on export controls and Korea's decision to suspend its WTO case against Japan pending the outcome of these talks. Um, in theory, these are two parallel things, but I suspect that there's some linkage uh, in private going on. And that's a positive first step, but this is not a solution. Um, and so the United States needs to remain engaged in both of these tracks to make sure that our two allies remain friends and continue working together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, we'll turn now to Mark Takala on uh, Korea and the Korea stock. Let's, I'll say first that being able to make this trip at all was like winning some international relations lottery. <laughs> Fantastic opportunity. I'll be, I'll be digesting what I've heard for a long time. Let me just add one quick footnote on, on Taiwan before I talk about Korea. One thing that struck me was the conversations we had about um, the fact that it's almost a laboratory of election interference to see what China does with the upcoming January 11th elections. Because China has access to, South Korea, to uh, Taiwanese social media. And they've planted false stories in the past. And everyone in Taiwan expects the Chinese will try to interfere with elections going at April, January 11. To see what China does there will be a good test case of what democracies do with elections and social media interference. Okay, on um, Korea, I'm going to try not to editorialize. I'm going to try to give you just a data dump of a lot of things I heard on South Korea. So I'm going to talk first about what South Koreans said about North Korea. And I'll talk about what South Koreans said about the United States. When I say uh, Koreans, I don't mean I can speak for what the entire country thinks. All I'm going to tell you is we heard the people we spoke to, which were predominantly progressives. We saw fewer conservatives in this trip. So this is a view of a few progressives. We take that for what it's worth. Uh, first on North Korea. Um, they said sanctions are having a big effect on North Korea. That was agreed. Uh, what North Korea wants most out of the talks is sanctions relief of some form. So trade is way off. Uh, one figure we heard was only $2 million in exports to North Korea and Russia last year, which is essentially nothing. Uh, the good, they're also trying to finance their imports by credit. Uh, China seems to be just giving them a line of credit to keep imports moving. There are two pieces of good news for North Korea on the economic sanctions front. One is they uh, seem to believe that the North Korean workers who are now in China and Russia, who are supposed to be expelled by the end of the year based on UN Security Council resolutions are probably not going to go anywhere. China and Russia are probably going to adjust their status from workers to trainees and just keep them. So the South Koreans aren't expecting much to happen. 
The second piece of good news for North Korea is that China is giving North Korea a lot of uh, food aid. They were saying they think between 600,000 to a million tons of food aid are coming from China and North Korea, which deals with North Korean food shortage. It also means North Korea doesn't have to pay for that food. That's giving them some economic relief. Our next point is they said there's no substantive dialogue going on between South Korea and North Korea now. They still have military hotline operational, and they check signals now and then to make sure they can hear each other. But no one's talking about anything. There's no talk about the conference of military agreement. There's no talk about cultural exchange. There's no talk about forestry or railways. There's no dialogue. That's just all ground to a halt. It seems North Korea is unhappy with um, South Korea because it believes South Korea has failed to follow through its economic um, promises. That's the North Koreans calling. Yeah, I've already said too much. It's one Lee Sion calling from Australia. So North Koreans are going to have to South Korea for not having followed through any kind of economic help. They say South Korea is offering no new ideas in North Korea. And it's so bad that when South Korea even offered to provide swine flu medication in North Korea, no strings attached, just veterinary assistance, North Korea didn't even reply. That's how bad things are between the two countries now. Uh, the South Koreans said they believe Kim Jong Un is very disappointed that the nuclear program has not led to any kind of diplomatic breakthrough. He thought it would. He's not satisfied. Uh, they said he's been having talks with China and Russia about what kind of security guarantees might be possible, preparing for talks with the U.S. to end. So North Korea is starting to think about a plan B. Um, the South Korean progressives' idea is we need to get together, South Korea and U.S., and think about a list of both how to punish North Korea when it misbehaves, but also how to reward North Korea if it does the right sorts of things. So they said that uh, Kim Jong-un thought that uh, shutting down the Kyogiri nuclear facility and returning the 55 remains of U.S. soldiers in the Korean War would lead to some kind of reciprocal step, but it didn't. So he's getting frustrated. The progressives said that uh, what Kim Jong-un needs is some kind of specific offers of support in detail. Not telling him about a better future for North Korea, that's too abstract a matter. What he really needs is concrete suggestions of what might happen if things go in the right direction. They said the U.S. should prepare a roadmap of corresponding measures in which we could use if North Korea took positive steps. The South Koreans said they're not clear what the U.S. even wants from North Korea at this point. The essential problem for South Korea is that Moon Jae-in has become irrelevant on North Korea. Now, he can't threaten them with anything, and he can't offer them anything, because the U.S. won't let him. So what is he to do? Uh, we asked about the Tokyo Olympics. They never raised it. But we said, what, have you thought about what's going to happen there? Because you had this unification team in South Korea, the Winter Olympics. What about Tokyo? And the person from the South Korean government we spoke to said, gee, have you even thought about that? I don't quite believe that. <laughs> That's what they said. All right, now we talk about uh, how South Koreans talk about the US. The burden sharing issue this $5 billion bill the U.S. is sticking South Korea with for the Special Measures Agreement uh, was a shock to them. They don't understand it. They said that South Korea already spends way above NATO lines on defense. They spend 2.6% of their GDP on defense already. They increased that by 8.2% last year. Um, compared to Germany, which spends 1.14% that's budget on defense, and Japan 0.95%. So why are we picking on South Korea? They donated the land for Camp Humphrey move, and they spent 93% of the construction cost to build Camp Humphrey. They spent us about $9.8 billion. They've already kicked in for defense. So why are we quintupling the bill for SMA, they say. Uh, if there's no SMA agreement by the end of the year, which is the deadline, they said it can go on a few more months. The real constraint is paying South Korean workers. There's probably some money in the budget to handle that for a while. But there will be resolved sooner or later. Essentially, what they're seeing is a lot of things happening all at once from the United States. Um, they said that we're used to America being a generous country, now it's demanding. So there's just one or two things they could deal with it, but we're giving them a whole lot of demand simultaneously, which is leading to some anti-American sentiment rising. What's the list look like? Uh, we restrain their ability to talk to North Korea as we enforce sanctions with them. Jasomia was a problem. Uh, they think the U.S. side with Japan went to Soviet. This burden-sharing bill, $5 billion, and the U.S. is pressuring South Korea to restrict its technological cooperation with China commercially. 
or tell her not to get involved with 5G or with uh, Huawei. They said, this is new. But in the past, the U.S. asked the alliance to be strengthened to deal with North Korea. Now the U.S. is saying we have to strengthen the alliance to deal with China. And this is not what South Korea signed up for. They believe that the uh, 5G and Huawei um, consideration of commercial activities. And if they're going to get involved in trying to do that from a security point of view, this is a new problem for South Korea, whether it could affect their economy directly. Uh, they're not sure if this America first is just Trump or if it'll continue after Trump. The progressives are arguing that the U.S. is entering a new isolationist era, which is going to make South Korea have to rethink its relationship. Very concretely, they see the U.S. government being very compartmentalized, which is new for them too. They said that when they talk to Trump, it's only about trade uh, merchandise deficits. That's all he cares about. He never talked about just something with them. They talk with Steve Began about North Korea. They talk with the Defense Department about Jasomia, but all those are separate lines of communication. There's no overall theme to the relationship, or there's no one to talk to about everything. So they have to deal with the U.S. on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's, that's awkward for them. So South Korea basically is, feels stuck, both domestically and internationally. Their economy is not picking up. It's drifting along about 2% now, which isn't bad by international standards, but not what South Koreans are used to. They're blaming Moon Jae-in for that. He supports down around 40%, roughly, heading into next April's elections. Uh, that's it sounds high, 40%, by, by his previous standards, it's very low. Moon Jae-in is extremely popular, even up to a year ago, but he's sliding now. It will make it harder for him to try to make concessions in the U.S. The economy is stalling, and the, the relationship with every country they care about has gotten worse in the past year. U.S., China, North Korea, Japan, nothing's working for them. Maybe the worst news for South Korea is that this slow growth combined with a demographic problem makes it look like there's going to be more political polarization. Their society is becoming a zero-sum game where there's no social mobility in South Korea. Then it's going to harden positions on both left and right. You'll get more labor militancy, and you'll get more conservative law and order talk. So that's bleak. If it sounds bleak, you heard me correctly. <laughs> so South Korea's not feeling well these days. Well, on that note, um, in South Korea and Taiwan are two places where people always complain. Yeah, never done that. Yeah. Uh, but it does give you a sense of uh, the state of play in Northeast Asia. We have about 30 minutes for Q and A from the floor. Again, for those who came in late, the ground rules are that we're on the record. The program is being live streamed. So I would ask you simply to state your name and your affiliation and then pose a question and comment to one or more of the panel presenters. Yes, here, please, sir. Sir. Uh, there isn't, but the mic here will take you. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, Mark, something you said uh, surprised me since the, the winner on crushing uh, Huawei is, is Samsung. Uh, so I don't get that. But my question is actually for Sue. Um, somewhere around the 1950s, we, we looked into the future and we saw that the situation with the Soviet Union was not getting better and would never get better. I think we're at that point with China. There's just no way to view a China which is going to be helpful to the world, will stop being selfish and so forth. So when you take over an area twice the size of Australia and the South China Sea, when you arrest one and a half million Muslims, creating the next generation of profoundly angry Muslims, the last thing this planet needs. Um, at some point in the next couple of years, we're going to find that same decision is pending. Uh, when is that point where we start with the massive information operations, uh, breaking the great wall and information censorship system, um, and actually uh, inviting the Chinese to make a different choice about their governance? Well, um Going to hit the Speak ROK one the about Samsung on Huawei oh, on 5G. I, yeah, I mean, that's in social media. But a lot of Americans think this could be a great benefit for South Korea and Japan, but they actually don't see it that way. We didn't hear that at all. For them, um, they need to make technological progress, and I think they think that they need to partner with China to do it. And that's going to be the way they can succeed in the world. I think they believe that there's a technology wall built between the uh, Japan, South Korea, and the US and China, there's not going to benefit South Korea and Japan. I, I know it sounds odd, but <laughs> they, they don't they're, see, very, they're very interrelated. They don't see a data localization and sort of separate internets as the wave of the future. 
they think it's still possible to breach those digitally and in 5G? That's the impression you have. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah and I think there's very much of a, an Asian sort of integration agenda at work here in the in the technology space as well that we don't see as much over here and with our focus sort of more towards Europe on a lot of these questions like data protection, et cetera. So on the other, um, you know, big picture question, I mean, I, I am a Russian expert by training and prior to the State Department, um, studied Russian, lived a long time in the Soviet Union. I do not agree that China and the Soviet Union pose the same problem to the United States. Um, I think that China poses a lot of problems, but it's not a question of trying to mount a uh, sort of system that can expand and take over the world and uh, sort of trump other kinds of uh, democratic systems and other systems in the world. I don't think that's the kind of competition that China is about. And um, I think that we make a profound mistake by thinking that that's the kind of competition that they're about. Uh, you know, I've written on this in other places, but you know, the Soviet Union posed a stark ideological challenge to the United States and other liberal democracies. China has basically become a market capitalist system. So the ideological competition is not there. And moreover, in the uh, sort of Soviet competition, you have this bipolar world where other countries, for better or for worse, were forced to pick a side. Uh, some countries tried not to pick a side. You had the non-aligned movement. But in the end, you know, basically, they all had to pick a side. Countries now do not see that it's in their interest to pick a side, and I don't think that they're going to be seeing it in the same through the same lens that we see it as far as what the choice is that they're facing. So I think we have to figure out, you know, and it, I think it's possible to do this, um, you know, what are the areas that are uh, profoundly challenging to us? Where can we get other countries in the world to join with us to mount defense against those challenges and then pursue those pursue those avenues effectively with our allies and counterparts. I think we can do that. I mean we've done that effectively with China in the past. I don't agree that they've taken over an area the size of Australia and the South China Sea. There's a lot of other claimants down there sailing our ships through there. Um, and I think that issue is not settled and we have to keep, you know, making it an issue so that it, it is um, continues to be source of um, contention, I guess, with China. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of issues on which we have to cooperate with China. China's not going anywhere. It's been around for a long time. And um, one of the comments by people in China uh, that we were raised was this issue of, can, can, is there something between convergence, which is what you're talking about, this sort of um, peaceful evolution so that China's system ends up looking a lot more like ours, um, something between that and decoupling, which is what a lot of people are talking about now. And um, I think it's absolutely uh, possible to do that, and that that's what we should be setting about doing. And I think it would be actually not that difficult to do, provided we get everybody on board with us to do it. If I could just add from a language point of view on China, I was impressed how domestically focused they were in our conversations. They were talking about reform inside China. By reform, they mean how to make more party discipline, how to reform the state enterprise to make them more efficient. But they're talking about kind of domestic problems. They said there's been a narrative for the last 40 years about uh, becoming powerful economically, and now they have to have a new kind of party narrative. But they're talking about internally. You know, how do you explain China to Chinese? Anyone else on the panel uh, want to make comments at this point before we turn? Uh, yes, Bella, please. Uh, Bella Lichen, uh, former visiting fellow here at the Stress Center. So my question is for Ms. Ponton. Yeah, when you talk to the Chinese about the situation in Nanjing, did anyone mention, you know, some about some cases where people, you know, claim to be witness escape from the detention camp, like the case about the uh, uh, woman Uyghur, uh, uh, Uyghur woman who. I think fled to Sweden. Did anybody mention about you know some potential real cases when you know the witness escaped from the camp? No, and I, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, but no, I don't think so. You're talking about the Xinjiang 
case of these uh, uh, camps in Xinjiang. Oh, sorry, Xinjiang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uyghurs and Kazakh. Yeah. So, no, we didn't speak about any specific cases. No. So what did, what did they say exactly, the Chinese, about the situation there? They said that they are undertaking an effort to eradicate extremist activity and extremist thinking uh, from among people who have shown signs of being susceptible to such thinking, a kind of a uh, re-education, if you will, and that they think that this will be a more uh, humane way of doing it than, um, you know, trying to uh, go around as the U.S. does with special forces and find, track people, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they even mentioned that the incidents of terrorist acts were down and they attributed it, you know, to this. I have seen <coughs> reports that you're talking about, at least just through the media, of people who have it said they were in camps and then left, especially women, and then um, are saying, you know, talking about the situation, but no one addressed that in, you know, when we were in China. Tom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Redford with the Foreign Policy Discussion Group. Uh, Ray, I wonder if you think that China has become any more knowledgeable about democracy in Taiwan. Uh, how much do you expect them to get involved in the election, and how successful do you think that they might be? Or may, may they create something absolutely counter to what they have in mind? They, they definitely, um, as Mark noted, they definitely uh, will, be trying, will be involved. Um, it was uh, while we were in, on our trip, the news came out about the uh, the details about how uh, Taiwan, how, how the mainland was spreading uh, disinformation and engaging in uh, disinformation in Hong Kong. And uh, that was very helpful to us in our discussions and has is very helpful to, uh, to the um, government in Taiwan in providing a concrete example with good, uh, good information uh, on how uh, of a of a of a case in which in which we can we can see uh, China's involvement in, in Hong Kong. Um, I would also say that when we were there last year, we were given some very detailed information about the way in which China tried to involve itself in the 2018 election. Um, Taiwan. The good news is Taiwan's become very very good at, uh, at tracking this kind of uh, this kind of uh, in, of, uh, of involvement. Um, IP addresses, how, how, mess, how messages are bounced from one IP address to another, and in some cases over many different addresses. Uh, the um, creation of thousands of fake Facebook pages, which then attract tens of thousands of fake likes. Um, this is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very elaborate uh, process. And, uh, it's so good that uh, our own people find they can actually learn something from Taiwanese about this now. And in fact, there have been uh, interesting conferences involving uh, some European countries, some other Asia-Pacific countries, uh, meeting together with Taiwan experts in Taiwan to talk about, to compare experiences in terms of election interference. So it's a, it's a whole new field <laughs> in which um, Taiwan is uh, taking something of a leadership position, I would say. So, but it's a question of, you know, what does the, I think the surprise that Beijing had uh, in reaction to the district council elections in uh, Hong Kong and the result uh, that came out last week, that surprise shows the, their, their difficulty in understanding how democracies work. Um, I think uh, it's becoming increasingly, you, you start to hear um, comments from Beijing figures who work on Taiwan issues or study Taiwan issues, which start to sort of suggest that we're not really trying to win hearts and minds anymore. You know, that's, that's, so I think I think 
that that will be that will be their 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 takeaway. That will be their reaction to uh, to the what has really increased estrangement between the two sides of the strait. I would just add one thing to what Ray said. The National Committee on American Foreign Policy put together a, a private talk a few months ago. What what he talked about. I'll bring our colleagues from Taiwan with colleagues from especially the Baltic countries and other NATO countries because they face the same problem but with a different interlocutor with the Russians mm -hmm. as opposed to the Chinese. And really, the um, the Taiwan uh, Taiwanese I think are really. Um, very advanced in that, and it was a great sharing of ideas. So that's one of the things that we work on the kinds of things we do. Very interesting. Sir, you were next in the yellow shirt. Or? Thank you. <clears throat> Donghui Yu, with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. And um, Ambassador uh, Berhard, you talk a lot about the uh, Beijing's view or Taipei's view about the cross trade relations. But I would like to know your take on this issue. Yeah, if Tsai is re-elected, uh, how would you pre predict the cross-strait relations and the U.S.-Taiwan relations? Do you think Beijing is losing its patience, considering the United States is strengthening the, you know, its support uh, for Taiwan uh, on the Capitol Hill? Right now, there's another uh, new bill is considered by the uh, senator, S.O. S O S bill, right? Yes. Yeah. So, do you think Beijing will lose its patience? Thank you. I don't know. I I think um, I think first of all, I think support on Capitol Hill for Taiwan has been true for forty years. Um, it goes up and down. It's now in a in a waxing phase. Um, I think uh, it's it's pretty solid. It People in Beijing who follow, who really understand what's going on and study the issue carefully, they know that. The Congress has always viewed Taiwan as sort of a ward of the U.S. Congress in many ways. Um, the, uh, what, uh, all right, even though this is public, <laughs> I, I've said this to my friend, I've said this to my friends in Beijing many times. Um, I don't. I, I think it's impossible to see a peaceful unification of Taiwan with the mainland. There, there's no scenario that's imaginable in which that would happen. Um, it's uh, the, the estrangement is that is, is so profound, and the sense of separate identity in Taiwan is so strong. So, um, and I think there are people in Beijing who realize that. So then it becomes um, a question of judging what kind of coercion would, it would be necessary, how you would do that, how much you can do through disinformation and information warfare, and how you prepare yourself militarily if you have to go to that level. And, um, I think there are some indications that you know, at least at least some of the leadership in Beijing is starting to think along those lines. It's not something that's going to happen peacefully, and therefore it's not going to happen quickly either. So they have to do the preparations for a long term in which it's going to have to be resolved in a forceful way, um, and we'll just have to respond to that. We'll have to make our own plans based on that dealing with that possible scenario as well. So you were next. Yeah, I'm George Hirsch, Hirsch Tax Law. I have a question specific to Ms. Thornton and also Mr. Burkhardt, but anybody else who has experience negotiating with China, talking with China. What I'm hearing here is what I already basically knew very different views on human rights, how to deal with dissidents, how to deal with Muslim people. I hear about re-education or whatever you want to call this. I hear about creating a new generation of angry young Muslims. So when you are talking about human rights questions, these more like human uh, things, where obviously there are 
different ways of looking at them, with different ways of thinking at them. At the same time, you need, you're trying to get hard results about um, security and how to deal with Taiwan, how to deal with North Korea. Um, how outspoken can you be? To what extent you have to hold back? To what extent you have to just to listen what they have to say? You sometimes have to swallow comments like you wouldn't probably not say something about you are creating the next generation of angry young Muslims. So to what extent can you make your points known and your different viewpoint known? And to what extent do you just have to hold back in the interest of perhaps other goals? Yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, actually we do say that you're creating a new generation of angry young Muslims. That's exactly say what we that, say. Okay. We say that it's not in your interest. This policy is not going to work well and it's going to backfire. Those are exactly the, the kinds of things that we say. I mean, we're all not representing a government at this point, right. so um, we don't have a lot of leverage, but we try to say things that are reasonable and make sense and try to persuade. And I think you know, that's kind of a throwback these days when you don't see much diplomacy being used around the world. And you see Japan and Korea swapping you know, trade punishments and national security punishments instead of sitting down and talking about things. I think. Many of us in this room who are former diplomats wish there was a uh, reversion to a, a quainter time when we could sit down with a lot of countries and talk through these things and try to reason things out and make sense and explain mm -hmm. why we think that a certain policy decision or another policy decision is unwise. Uh, but on the issue of human rights in general, I mean, I would say that this is, even though there's a UN convention, of course, and uh, Declaration of Universal Human Rights, there's not a lot of uh, leverage built into those instruments mm -hmm. and you know the Chinese would say as they did to us many times on this trip that you know this is an internal affair of China Hong Kong um, Taiwan less so but certainly the Xinjiang situation and that they're dealing with it and that they're uh, this is their policy so um, there are a lot of things that they complain about that we do too where we put up similar defenses and say this is this is a priority for us. This is our so your Chinese counterparts are equally outspoken then? In oh, I would say so, yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on this? Uh, i just yeah. say that I always remember that they're a Leninist political system and they're very good students of La Verla. <laughs> Especially Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. Is there a question here, sir? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, my name is Mitsuong Nakai, uh, Reagan Foundation. Uh, I have a question for Jim. Uh, Japan's military budget has been 1% of their GDP for years and years. Was there any talk when you were there uh, of increasing uh, that? Uh, their budgetary system is a little bit different than ours, uh, so that's probably complicated a little more. Number two, there was a talk of uh, the, a little bit of a complaints uh, on the uh, air drill in Iwo Jima, uh, uh, the U.S. forces, uh, but there was some need, uh, mainly because of uh, Okinawa situation is uh, not so, the citizens are not happy there, so they were t talking about looking for some, uh, a different site other than uh, Guam. Uh, did they talk about that a little bit? with you or did not? Uh, thank you. Yeah, first of all, on the um, issue of what percent of GDP is Japan spending on defense, you know, a lot depends on what you count. And Japan, uh, for decades, has had as a political target, there's no legal requirement, but as a political target to spend less than 1% of GDP on defense. And one way they've gotten around this political target is to spend money on things that they don't call defense. So um, we'd have to look at the total package of what Japan is bringing to the alliance. Um, and one of those things is um, financing uh, construction on US bases in Japan. Um, Mark already mentioned that I think the Koreans um, furnishing the land and over 90% of the construction costs for Camp Humphreys. But if you look at um, three of the four largest military construction projects in the world right now are financed by Koreans and Japanese. There's Camp Humphreys, uh, there's the um, uh, uh, new runway at Iwakuni and then the new base in Okinawa. Yeah. And then also the um, Japan is furnishing $4 billion 
for construction of facilities on Guam. Uh, so it's the first time in history that a foreign power is paying the United States to build a U.S. base on U.S. soil. So there's a lot of, it depends on how you count, I guess is the point I would make. Um, on the issue, just briefly on Iwo Jima, no, we didn't discuss this, but just briefly for the audience, what this is is the carrier air wing, the only home-ported U.S. carrier abroad is in Japan, and the pilots need to practice nighttime landing practice before the carrier departs port so they can be qualified, and they've been doing this on Iwo Jima Island, which is very inconvenient. It's far away from where the carrier is based. It's about a four and a half hour flight to get down there, and there's no alternate airfield in case of a mishap. There's nowhere else you can go to land if you're having a problem. So for years, the Japanese have been trying to identify a new facility. This has been made more urgent because the carrier um, air wing is moving down to Iwakumi in western Japan because it of this Is this purchased already? Or? Um, well, there's, there are still talks going on, and like any landholder, when suddenly your island becomes more valuable, you raise the price on what it costs to sell it. So there's that issue, but the Japanese repeatedly promise that they will identify an island, build an airfield where the uh, pilots from U.S. aircraft carrier can do their nighttime landing practice. So uh, it's been delayed, but I think it's uh, moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, excuse me, just one more thing. Just, just one more. Yeah. Make it short. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I heard the, uh, the Trump administration taking money from uh, what I'm talking about, uh, the relocation of part of the U.S. Marines to Guam. It takes so much money to do that. But that the budget was allocated, and the transmit administration was taking the money out to build the wall down south. Did you hear that? <laughs> I, what, what, yeah, what the administration decided was to take money out of what they call military construction, which yeah. is repairing facilities or building new facilities on U.S. bases. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent that has an impact on U.S. facilities in Okinawa. But you're right that the Japanese saw this as. You know, we have this agreement, they will spend a certain amount of money and we will spend a certain amount of money to build facilities. And it appears to the Japanese as if we're walking back on that agreement because of funding availabilities. I'm not sure, to be honest, what the Defense Department is telling the Japanese. I'm sure they're saying they're not canceling these projects, but I don't know the details. I heard the Japanese government made a donation for that purposes, relocation, some, something like $1.3 billion or something like that. Um, actually, the total figure for various kinds of construction on Guam is over $4 billion of yeah. Japanese money going toward. A lot of it is housing and sewage the and the infrastructure in Guam. To move the Marines, right, James? Yes, correct. In fact, Satu, you may know more about yes. this than I do. But. The, the 8,000 Marines, yeah. The, the level of Japanese support for the infrastructure. And it isn't yeah. just the military facilities. It's, the, it's exactly, as you said, the housing as well as facilities to integrate having such a large marine presence on a small yeah. island is enormous. Sir, you were next. Yes. Uh, my name is Kim Se. I'm a, a voice of American Masons. I have a question to you about the um, Concerning the protest in Hong Kong, how much do you think uh, China would go? And also, uh, away, a little bit away from that, the, the proxy war. Uh, it's not US-China war, but the proxy war. How far are that, uh, China going to press uh, country of their uh, from their alliance to uh, issue statement to uh, endorse action in Hong Kong. Because for the case of Cambodia, uh, the government of Cambodia endorsed the China China action in Hong Kong. And also uh, last just last week, the police Cambodian police also issue an endorsement to uh, the Hong Kong police uh, action against protester. I, I hadn't noticed about the. Uh... Cambodian statements on Hong Kong. I, I, even if I'd read them, I'm not sure I would have noticed them. Um, <laughs> Cambodia tends to be, uh, and the Hun Sen government tend to be uh, pretty friendly toward uh, toward Beijing. So I, I don't think that's I mean, that's there's nothing remarkable about that. I would say. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I'm not going to give predictions about what's going to happen in Hong Kong. I, I, uh, I, I but I think. Uh, It doesn't look like a situation that's going to be resolved uh, anytime soon. Okay, one thing we heard I thought was interesting was the idea that um, for, for China, they show some of the demonstrations arriving on state television in China. And their story is, look what happens if you allow demonstrators in protest to get out of their hand. The order is much better than letting this happen. So they portray an object lesson. 
Susan, I want to ask you what, oh, I'm sorry, was there? I mean, I would just I, add to that on Hong yeah. Kong that in, pretty uniformly in China, what we heard is that the government feels comfortable that this unrest in Hong Kong is not spilling over Hong Kong's borders into other places in the mainland, and that actually there is not a lot of support among mainlanders for what is going on in Hong Kong. So the central government, we were told, felt pretty comfortable letting Hong Kong authorities handle it, including Hong We left, that's the, that was the state of play. Ray mentioned that Taiwan could come back on the U.S.-China agenda in a more forceful way after the uh, trade, I think. The, the I said that some people in China. Some people in yeah. China think that. Yeah. Uh, what was your sense of where Beijing is on the trade deal? I mean, we get every hour we... We've gone through an <laughs> hour and a half, and we, no one mentioned no one U.S.-China trade negotiations. Negotiation just certainly come up in yeah, the negotiation. And I kept wondering, <laughs> both in Shanghai and in Beijing, <laughs> not to mention other places, it, this deal seems to be the it's litmus test. the U.S. financial press, but uh, right. Right. <laughs> maybe that's... Um, what did they say in, the, in Northeast Asia? About yeah, this? I mean, I think that we've been so through so much back and forth on this that the feeling that the Chinese are having certainly is that the U.S. government isn't going to be able to close a deal, mm. that, that and that it's there isn't really, really a real deal that, to be had there because um, I think the indications we get is that there are still some major issues on the kind of um, unsettled list, including whether or not tariffs that have been imposed would be rolled back, which is the sort of bottom line for the Chinese in this negotiation. So um, I think, you know, maybe, I mean, we did have conversations about how the economic relationship would go forward, whether there would be a deal done, and certainly we would advocate that a deal, you know, this, we were talking mostly about this phase one deal, which is somehow a partial or small deal uh, compared to what uh, we were hearing about a year ago. But uh, certainly we were advocating that we get that done, but it doesn't feel like it is coming together in the way that sometimes is uh, mentioned in the U.S. press on this. So, and the Chinese seem to be pretty resigned to it, to it not material. And they're okay with that? They, 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 well, they would they're... prefer to have a deal, but I don't think they believe in it. One of our core leaders, interlocutors, um, said that in his view, that China's concluded that Donald Trump is what he said, a pretty simple guy. That if they would just give him um, a lot of purchase in the U.S., that that'd settle it. Um, even someone in China said that, that at least we'll buy a lot of stuff. We'll buy a lot of soybeans, and then Trump will settle it. George Trump will reform. Just one big purchase or a couple of big purchases, he would settle it. He's allowed to. Presumably later into 2020, I guess, from, the, yeah. from the perspective of that kind of deal. Mm -hmm. John, and then just yeah. um, yes. okay, I'll go. Oh, you, you have yeah. Last question, John. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. Um, John Faye with the Mansfield Foundation. Uh, in your travels uh, in Taiwan, did you observe any kind of thinking about uh, China, uh, Taiwan's tethering of its economy uh, with that of China? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very big issue in Taiwan. Um, you know, the 40% uh, exports going to, 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 uh, to China and so forth. Um, they have actually somewhat, we did hear that Taiwan investment in China is, is way down in, in 2019. I, I have the figure somewhere in my notes, but it's, it's a significant uh, decrease uh, over the same nine months in 2018. Are uh, they disinvesting? Dis there's been disinvestment, but also a drop in new investment as, at the same time, yeah. Um, the, uh, and the new southbound policy, which is sort of directing trade and, and tourism and so forth towards Southeast Asia and South Asia, frankly, I was very skeptical of it when the idea came out a few years ago. It actually seems to be meaningful. It seems to be substantive. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, there's significant, the figures show significant increases in trade with ASEAN countries, and also uh, 
big increases in tourism from ASEAN countries coming coming to Taiwan. Well, I'm afraid we do have to end it there because we are running a couple minutes over. But let me just thank Ambassador Elliott uh, and and see let me see if I get the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. <laughs> I was going to try to do an acronym, but the, I'm glad I didn't try. The lottery try. division that <laughs> right. won the right. lottery. I like that. I like Nick that. House. But a uh, wonderful delegation, <laughs> and I thank you for um, bringing your program and your uh, delegation's visits findings to the East West Center here in Washington. So thank you very much, thank and you. to your team. And um, I just can't help but say on Ray's uh, comments about new southbound policy, we have a series of analyses, 1,000 word analyses, precisely on regional views of Taiwan's new southbound policy and Taiwan's aspirations, which is out in front if you want to pick up copies. But again, please join me in thanking this terrific delegation.